Hello, everyone. Thank you very much to everyone that has remained from the last talk. I apologize. I'm here again. Um, you'll be really glad to know that I'm not on the next time slot here. You get a break from me, but then I am on the last time slot. So it's kind of like alternating me. Um, so thank you for the people that have remained. I appreciate your patience. It's also going to be quite amusing to see if I can remain awake because I'm quite badly jet lagged. So the last talk might be a little bit dodgy. We will give it a go. So uh, welcome to our talk uh, on logging and metrics. My name, as you know from the last talk, is Colin Humphreys. I'm the CEO of Cloud Credo. Uh, presenting uh, to my left is Ed King. Hello. Who also works for Cloud Credo. Uh, we are a uh, Cloud Foundry and Bosch consultancy based in London. So very quick sales pitch. If you want help with Cloud Foundry, please do get in contact. Come and talk to us. Um, we love working with organizations that are trying to do interesting things with Cloud Foundry. So <clears throat> I'm going to talk very briefly about why logging and monitoring are so important. So the first time I used Cloud Foundry, I thought it was fantastic, it was absolutely amazing. I had an application. I called CF push my application. Staging happened and it ran. And I thought, this is going to change my career. This is going to change IT. This is going to change how we deliver value. The world is a better place now I can CF push applications. And it was until my application broke. And then I had absolutely no idea what was going on because the black box of the PaaS made it all so opaque. I trusted the PaaS to run my app, and if it broke, what was going on? Particularly if staging failed, the user journey used to be, I have absolutely no idea why the staging has gone wrong. Quite often you've got no logs at all, you just had staging has failed. So, Things have improved in Cloud Foundry, but I want to know, how do I get access to logs, to metrics, and to monitoring? And Ed's going to take us through the components in Cloud Foundry and how they allow us to do that. OK, thank you, Colin. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd just like to start by um, covering some of the main components involved in the Cloud Foundry logging and metrics system. Um, and as with most things in Cloud Foundry, uh, the system is constantly being updated and improved. And especially recently, there have been some fairly big changes to the way that the logging and metrics system works. Um, and so I think it'd just be a good idea just to start by taking a look at the current state of the system, what components are there, um, and how they work as well. So the first component I'd like to talk about is Logregator. And Logregator is really at the core of the Cloud Foundry logging and metrics system. It's currently comprised of uh, a few smaller components, uh, namely the sources, Metron, Doppler, and the traffic controller. And I'll talk a little bit more about those uh, in just a second. Uh, but just to sort of give you a, a general overview of the Logregator system uh, as a whole, um, this is the component that allows developers to stream their application logs in real time down to the CLI. And that can be achieved by running the CF logs my app command from the CLI. It also allows developers to dump a recent subset of their logs. And it can also provide functionality for draining those logs off to third party syslog drains. And how this all works. Um, the Doppler component basically sits there and gathers all of the logging and metrics data from the platform. And it stores this logging and metrics data in temporary buffers on the Doppler servers. Um, but it's really, really important to realize that, that the Doppler servers don't uh, retain that data uh, on a long-term basis. 
And actually, Cloud Foundry doesn't really ship with a component to provide long-term storage um, and indexing and parsing of the log messages. And so we'll be taking a look at a, a project that we can use to actually provide that functionality uh, in, in just a few minutes' time. Um, but just be aware that one, once those buffers fill up, um, your logs are kind of dropped off the end and, and lost. And the other component I briefly mentioned was the traffic controller. So this is the component that actually accepts the incoming requests for our logging and metrics data. And it can then forward that, those requests onto the Doppler servers in the back. So this diagram here, I've, um, I've shamelessly ripped this diagram straight from the GitHub page for the Logregator. Um, but it gives a pretty good overview of the Logregator system um, and some of the components involved. So just to briefly run through some of these then, on the left-hand side, we have the sources. And the sources are the components that are actually generating the logging and metrics data. So an example of the source would be uh, the DEA logging agent, for example. And the sources generate all of this logging and metrics data and forward it onto a component known as Metron. And Metron is a, a small Go library that basically sits there and gathers all of that incoming data and is responsible for forwarding it on to the relevant Doppler servers. And so, as such, um, the Metron agents get co-located across every VM in your Cloud Foundry deployment. And typically, the sources will log to the local Metron agent, and Metron will forward that off to the Doppler servers. And then, as I said, once the data comes into the Doppler servers, stored in those temporary buffers, and we have functionality for shipping those logs off to syslog drains, um, or the log regator traffic controller can accept incoming requests uh, and forward those on to the Doppler servers. Uh, so that's all great, um, but really the most, the most awesome feature of, of log regator, or in my opinion, the most awesome feature, uh, is a relatively new feature called the fire hose. And I guess the definition of the fire hose is a stream of every application's logs plus metrics data from the Cloud Foundry's components. So application logs should be fairly self-explanatory, but the, uh, the metrics data is slightly more interesting. So to give you an example of the metrics data, uh, the Cloud Foundry router is, is constantly emitting metrics events for every single HTTP request coming in and out of the platform. So for example, it will emit metrics events uh, detailing uh, response times or status codes for each of the requests. And all of these events get, get gathered up and are forwarded down the, the, the fire hose. Um, but obviously, by, by default, every single application log, as well as every piece of metrics data, is quite a lot of data. Um, and so because of that, this, this notion or this concept of nozzles has been introduced. And a nozzle is basically a pluggable component that can attach to the fire hose, pull down just a subset of the data that you might be interested in, do some processing on that data, and then forward it off to some third party, uh, for example, syslog or graphite. So I believe there's a, uh, there's a fire hose to syslog nozzle, uh, which I, th I think is available now in the Cloud Foundry community GitHub page, which, as the name suggests, connects to the fire hose pulls down some logs, and forwards them off into syslog. Um, and that sort of concludes just talking about the main components involved in, in the Cloud Foundry system. Um, and I think back over to Colin to introduce yeah. logs. So logs. The reason I wanted to talk a little bit and interject into Ed's talk is because the the first time I really needed to get logs out of Cloud Foundry, it was a Cloud Foundry version one installation we were working on with a client. Um, we, we'd given them this setup, and it was working pretty well. And then something went wrong with their application. And they said, how do we see the logs from this? It's all gone wrong. I need to see some logs. I've got a you know, big problem here. How do we get to the logs? And I said, OK. What we're going to do, you're going to subscribe to the NAT's message bus. You're going to filter the messages for something that looks kind of log-shaped when you think things are going on. And then we're going to try and work out what's happening from there onwards. 
and it was an atrocious journey. It really was. So this, for me, is one of the biggest pain points, or has been a big pain point, in Cloud Foundry. And now it's got a lot better. So over to you, Ed. How do we now get to these logs? How do we now get some insight into what's happening when our application isn't working right? Sure. Um, so I'm going to talk about a project called Log Search. And the Log Search project allows us to essentially integrate the Elk stack with our Cloud Foundry deployment. Um, so one of the things that Log Search does is to package up the components of the Elk stack as a Bosch release. Um, and for those of you not familiar with the Elk stack, uh, it stands for Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana, where Elasticsearch provides the backend storage and indexing of your logs. Logstash provides the, the filtering and parsing of your log messages. And Kibana provides the front-end web interface. And so Log Search takes all of those components and neatly packages them up and makes them available to us via Bosch. And the good news about Log Search is that it's completely open source and free. You can go and download it right now. Uh, it's available on GitHub. And I'd like to just say a quick thanks to uh, David Lang and to all of the contributors and maintainers of Log Search um, because it's really awesome. And I'm just going to spend the next few minutes talking about uh, what a log search deployment looks like, what the components are involved, um, and also how we can integrate it with our Cloud Foundry deployment to provide that long-term storage of, of our log messages. Uh, so on that note, um, very excited to announce a new project, the, the Log Search for Cloud Foundry project. And this project is really focused towards uh, customizing log search to work with Cloud Foundry data. Uh, and it does this by allowing Log Search to accept logs uh, from our Cloud Foundry deployments uh, from two main sort of input streams. So the first stream is from the Cloud Foundry component syslog uh, message, messages. Um, so every component in Cloud Foundry emits syslog messages, and we can tell Cloud Foundry to forward those messages off into our Log Search deployment. That's the first way. And the second way is that we can also tell Log Search to talk to the firehose and to pull down uh, log messages from there as well. Um, and the project is really sort of focused towards two main user groups. So there's the Cloud Foundry developer, who's going to be mostly interested in getting application logs uh, or their own application logs. And there's also the Cloud Foundry operator who's going to want to see all of the system logs for the, for the system as a whole. And, and Log Search for Cloud Foundry provides some really nice multi-tenancy options to ensure that um, users can only access the logs that they are actually responsible for. Um, and it's pretty cool how it does that. So there's, a, um, there's essentially a proxy that sits in front of the system that goes off and talks to the UAA server, um, determines which spaces the user has access to. And then it uses that, along with Elasticsearch aliases, um, to basically filter down the amount of logs that the users can see. And so we end up where users can only see the logs that they actually have access to. Um, if you want a little bit more detail about how that's, that's all set up, there's a couple of links there um, to some YouTube videos uh, where, where David goes into more detail about, about that. So this image here, this is the Kibana web interface. Um, as I'm sure you'll agree, it's, it's very, very uh, pretty. Like, it looks great. Um, what we're actually seeing here is uh, a dashboard showing three demo applications logging through the log search system. Uh, one of the nice things to point out here is that we've got the actual application names coming up in the dashboard, as opposed to just the, the UIDs. So it's a very user-friendly interface. Um, great to use, and it just generally looks, looks pretty good. Uh, this slightly less impressive looking diagram is, is one I drew myself, um, but it helps to sort of give an overview of all of the components that are, are involved in a, a typical log search deployment. And it sort of shows that the, the journey that a log message would take, starting with Cloud Foundry on the left, 
and going through the log search system to end up in Elasticsearch at, at the back. So I'm just going to run through each of these components to sort of give you a quick overview of what they do. Uh, the first component is the ingester. And the ingesters are really responsible for accepting incoming logs into the log search system. And log search ships with a couple of default ingesters, uh, namely syslog with TLS and a rope ingester as well. And if you also happen to be deploying the log search for Cloud Foundry Bosch release, uh, we get an additional ingester. And that is the component that could go and pull down logs from the fire hose. So the ingesters are basically the entry point to log search for your log messages. Once the logs have been ingested, they are then forwarded on to the queue. And the queue component is currently provided by Redis. And this is actually a really, really nice addition to the standard ELK stack. Um, it provides us with a couple of benefits. So the first benefit is that it helps to keep the system stable um, if you were to experience a sudden increase in the volume of logs coming through your system. So Redis provides a nice temporary buffer and it gives you a little bit of time to just go and scale the relevant components so that you're able to keep up with the demand of the increase in, in logging traffic. Uh, one of the other things it does is help to prevent against message loss um, in some certain scenarios. So for example, if you were to lose your Elasticsearch backend for whatever reason, Again, Redis gives you that temporary buffer, buffer and gives you a little bit of time to go and figure out what's wrong before you start losing your logging messages. So it just generally helps to keep the whole thing a lot more stable. Um, and that just ships with the, with the standard log search Bosch release, which is, which is great. Uh, once the messages have made it through the queue, they are then forwarded onto the parsers. And this is where the actual filtering and parsing of the log messages actually occurs. Um, so as I'm sure you're aware, um, every single log message under the sun is going to be in a slightly different format. Um, and the parsers are really attempting to take that mishmash of logging data and turn it into something that we actually want to use and to store. Uh, so the parsers are running Logstash um, in order to do this. And log search ships with a few default filters to do some standard uh, filtering and parsing of log messages, such as um, cleaning up the white space, for example. And it also, um, it's also uh, enables you to write your own filters as well. And log search provides some, some nice tooling around helping you to write those filters and, and get them included in your log search deployment. Once the logs have been parsed, they are then finally forwarded onto Elasticsearch, where they can be stored and indexed, and they can remain there for as long as you need them to be. And the final component then is the, the Kibana web interface, which we, we, we saw earlier. And as I said, this provides the front end web interface uh, and the nice dashboards as well. Um, and it's probably worth me also mentioning that um, alongside Kibana, Log search uh, exposes a read-only Elasticsearch API as well. And this is great for, for integrating with, with other third parties. Um, so for example, uh, the CFCLI, we could write a plugin to go and grab logs out of, out of the system uh, using, using that endpoint. Um, and just to show this again, then, um, that's sort of the system as a whole. So we, uh, export our logs from Cloud Foundry, they get ingested, pass through the queue, parsed and formatted, and then end up in Elasticsearch. So that's all great. Um, by now you must surely be wondering, how do I actually do this? How do I get this all set up? Uh, and the good news is, is that it's actually not too difficult, uh, assuming you've got a little bit of Bosch knowledge. And I know that might be quite a lot to ask, but it's, it's really, really worth investing some time in becoming more familiar with Bosch, uh, because it helps um, with deploying a complicated stack, such as the Elk stack, um, and it helps to make the, the deployment and management of that much, much easier. So just at sort of a, a very high level, what you'd need to do then, 
Uh, the first step is you need to upload the Bosch releases. So the Bosch release um, contains the actual source packages that are going to be running as part of this deployment. And there's currently two of them. There's the standard log search Bosch release, which contains the Elk stack. And then there's the new additional log search for Cloud Foundry Bosch release, which contains that additional ingester that can talk to the fire, uh, to the fire hose. And this is simply just a case of Bosch upload release from the command line. Um, so, so fairly simple so far. The next step is that we need to configure a few properties within the deployment manifests. Uh, so because we are running a Cloud Foundry deployment and a log search deployment as well, we're going to end up with two separate deployment manifests. Um, and if you're not familiar with the deployment manifest, this is basically the file that details what your deployment actually looks like. So for example, in the log search manifest, you could say, I want to have 10 Elasticsearch nodes. Um, I want them to run on these IP addresses, um, et cetera, et cetera. And we can use the properties to customize those installations. So the first properties we need to set um, are properties in the Cloud Foundry deployment. And we need to set the syslog daemon config properties. Um, and these are the properties that tell Cloud Foundry to forward all of the syslog messages. And we will point it at the syslog ingester of our log search deployment. Um, and the second set of properties that we need to set are the ingester Cloud Foundry Firehose properties. Um, and these live in the log search um, deployment manifest. And these properties just detail um, a user that can access the firehose, the actual firehose endpoint, et cetera, et cetera. So we set those properties, save the file, and then hit Bosch deploy, at which point Bosch will go and do its thing um, and go and set up everything for you. Um, and that's actually really, really awesome because we've essentially gone from having nothing to a fully scalable Elk stack with Cloud Foundry forwarding all of the logs through the system in essentially just a few commands, um, which I think is really, really great. Um, but I am aware that, that not everyone loves Bosch, um, and it can be very difficult to get started with it. Um, so I'd like to point you towards a, uh, a separate project, the Log Search Bosch Workspace, which really aims to sort of help you get up and running with this um, as quickly as possible. And that's available in the Cloud Foundry community. So why should you choose Log Search? Um, obviously, it's open source. Um, that's awesome. Um, but really, my, my sort of favorite thing about Log Search is that, as, as I say, it ex extracts all of the complexity, or most of the complexity, of, of managing the Elk stack. And being able to define everything in a single deployment manifest um, is really great. And it actually makes it very easy to scale the system as well. Um, so for example, if we want to scale our Elasticsearch cluster, all we need to do is edit one value in that file and then hit Bosch deploy. And Bosch and Log Search will go and handle the rest for you. Um, and while we're talking about scaling, uh, the graph on the right there uh, gives an overview of the number of VMs that you'd need to run for Log Search uh, in order to ingest uh, X logs per minute. So I think that's 10 VMs for 300,000 logs a minute, um, which, which is fairly reasonable. But I, I guess the thing to note there is that it's pretty, it's pretty linear. So it seems to scale pretty well. And that's the end of the, the logging section. Uh, Thank you very much. Thanks, Ed. Um, I just want to say at this point, we've, we've got a good solution for logs, but there is more to life than logs. There's more to life than just looking at when things go wrong. We want to spot patterns. We want to spot trends. We want to see that we can uh, uh, address issues before they become the kind of things that crop up in logs, as you know, explosions and stack traces. So how do we look at the metrics in the system? PaaS is like a black box. So how do we get the metrics out, get them viewed, and how do we graph all the things? Ed? Yes. So uh, let's talk about Graphite and how we can integrate Graphite with Cloud Foundry. 
so Graphite is a graphing and metrics tool that's gained quite a lot of popularity over the past few years. Um, and I, I think that this has been partly due to, uh, to a famed blog post written by the team at Etsy. Um, and one of the things that they mention in that, in that article is how at Etsy they worship at the church of graphing and how they use graphite to achieve this. Um, and so it would be great if we could have our own church of graphing available uh, for Cloud Foundry. Uh, and fortunately, we can. And there's actually quite a few ways that we can do this. Um, and I'm just going to talk about two of the ways that we can integrate Graphite with Cloud Foundry to provide a really nice metrics solution. So the first approach is that we could use the Cloud Foundry collector. And the collector is an optional component that ships with a standard Cloud Foundry deployment. Um, but I've kind of refrained from talking about the collector too much in this talk. Um, the reason being that it's, it's sort of being deprecated in favor of the firehose. Um, but actually, it is pretty quick and easy to set up. And, and maybe if you're stuck running an older version of Cloud Foundry for whatever reason, um, the collector is, is a quick solution that you can use to get some metrics out of the system. Um, so the collector works by basically querying the slash health Z and slash var Z HTT endpoints of all of the Cloud Foundry components. Um, so every component in Cloud Foundry um, exposes these endpoints. Slash health Z will return either a one or a zero, depending on whether or not the process is healthy or not. And slash var Z will return some more detailed information um, about the process. So for example, if you query slash var Z on a UAA server, it will return some information about the underlying Java process. And so the collector sits there querying all of these endpoints for all of the components, um, gathering all the data, um, and it then uses what is called a historian to forward that data onto some third party. Um, and fortunately, there's a graphite historian to do this. Um, I should just mention, though, that this is currently considered to be a community-maintained feature, um, so it's not being actively developed anymore. Um, but it does work, and, and as I said, it's quite e quick and easy to get, to get it set up. So to actually do this, all we need to do is ensure that the collector is included as part of your Cloud Foundry deployment. Um, and then we just need to set a couple of properties. Uh, so you want to set use graphite to be true, and that you then want to provide the IP address and port of a uh, graphite server. Um, fairly quick and easy. And, and you go and run Bosch deploy, and, and it just goes and does its, thing, does its thing, and we end up with our metrics in Graphite. So that's kind of OK, but there are a few problems with using that approach, uh, namely that it's being deprecated. Um, so an alternate approach that we could use then is to grab our metrics directly from the fire hose using a nozzle. Um, so I was kind of interested to see what a nozzle might look like for Graphite. And so, so I wrote the, uh, the creatively named graphite-nozzle, which is available on the Cloud Credo GitHub page. Um, and this is a small Go program that, as I said, connects to the fire hose, listens for all of the metrics events, pulls them down, does some parsing and processing on them, and then forwards them off to a graphite server. Um, and that's generally working quite, quite well. Um, so please feel free to check that out and, and let me know what you think. Uh, this picture, this is an example of what a, a graphite server might look like. Um, probably not all that, that um, impressive at the moment, um, but it's got some nice pretty colors and, and graphite always looks good um, on monitors throughout your office, um, which is great. And I think that that is everything. So thank you very much for listening. Um, I hope that you found it to be useful.